Uh, we move on to our next uh, speaker, um, Thomas Rermer uh, from the University of Lausanne. And he will be speaking on the revelation of the divine name to Moses. Good morning. If you happen to be at the end of a conference, it's always difficult to say something new because every, everything has said already, so I could also stop here. Uh, <clears throat> I will speak about a lot of text we've seen already, but maybe I will put them in a little different way. And since my paper is too long also, I have to summarize some of my points. And the first points I want to summarize is the introduction. Of course, it is clear that the Exodus tradition is at the very center of the Hebrew Bible, and you can take, for instance, the opening of the Decalogue, or where Yahweh presents himself as the God who brought out Israel of Egypt. What is interesting is that there is no mention of Moses, and there is a lot of texts that speak about the Exodus without mentioning Moses. The agent is Yahweh, and this is especially the case if you look at the Psalms. In the Psalms, you have Moses in very few and late Psalms. Most Psalms that uh, allude to the Exodus do not mention Moses, so the actor is Yahweh. And this also uh, is, uh, in a way, comparable to the very sparse appearances of Moses outside the Deuteronomistic history. In fact, there are only two texts, Isaiah 63 and Micah 6, who speak about Moses involved in the Exodus. And when we go further to 1 Kings 12, the same uh, idea occurs. According to this narrative, Jeroboam builds sanctuaries in Bethel and Dan, where he places bull statues with the exclamation, Hine Elohecha Yisrael Asher HaElucha Me'eretz Mitzrayim. What is intriguing there is a plural. Why are there gods? Because, of course, you can say the text speaks of two sanctuaries, but it is clear that the bulls or the calves are not representing different deities, but the national god. So should one then understand the plural as alluding to the national god and his consort Asherah, as suggested, for instance, by Axel Knauf. Uh, however, there are no clear hints elsewhere that Asherah might be associated here with the Exodus, so this idea remains very speculative. Another idea would be to take the plural as allusion to Yahweh in his different manifestations, the Yahweh from Bethel and the Yahweh from Dan. Or maybe the easiest solution is to say that we have here a polemical transformation of the singular, of an original cultic exclamation, which would be then very close to the Decalogue. It is clear that the Judean redactor of this text apparently wanted to convince that the northern cult in Basel and Dan was a polytheistic one. The mention of Dan is also quite intriguing. According to Eran Arye and others, Dan became part of Israel only in the 8th century. And in this case, it may be possible that 1 Kings 12 is a retroprojection from the time of Jeroboam II. One may even consider whether the figure of Jeroboam I is simply a creation based on the figure of King Jeroboam II, but this is beyond the topic of our paper. So coming back to Yahweh and the Exodus, it clearly appears that at least since the 8th century, Yahweh was venerated in the north, in Israel, as a deity who brought his people out of Egypt. But in these texts, which can be confidently dated to the monarchic times, there is no mention of Moses. Of course, I leave aside for the moment the Pentateuchal texts, whose dates are conspicuously complicated. The construction of the Exodus as a real national memory can be traced in chapter 12 in the book of Hosea. This chapter may reflect, if not the voice of the prophet himself, at least the situation in the north of the second half of the 8th century. As Albert de Puri has shown, this text opposes the Jacob and the Exodus tradition. Jake was depicted very negatively in this text. He supplanted his brother and he has become a Canaanite, a merchant with false balances who likes to oppress. And even his battle with God, in contrast to Genesis 33, uh, 32, related in a very negative manner. What is also interesting is that whereas Jacob is related in this text to a deity that is called Elohim or El, 
Yahweh presents himself as a God from the land of Egypt. Anochi Yahweh Elohecha Me'eretz Mitzrayim. Against this statement is reminiscent of the Decalogue, also there here is no bringing out. Yahweh himself is described as the deity whose origins are related to Egypt. In verses 13 to 14, Jacob's fly to Aram and his slavery on behalf of a woman are opposed to Yahweh's prophet who is leading Israel out of Egypt and who guards it. It's really a parallel as you can see here. The mention of the prophet is prepared in verses 11, which claims that Yahweh reveals his will through his prophets. It is usually assumed that the prophet mentioned in verse 14 is Moses. But interestingly, he's not named. So why is it so? Perhaps because the prophetic group behind Hosea 12 is a group which seeks legitimacy by claiming that there was already a prophetic mediation at the time of the Exodus. So Hosea 12 can be understood as a polemical text against the Jacob tradition, against the attempt to establish the Jacob tradition as the official national origin myth in the North, and verses 4 to 5 hints at the change of the name of Jacob to Israel, the author of Hosea 12 claims that Yahweh is related to Egypt and not to the patriarch. And this also means that the relation between Israel and his God is not a hereditary one or mediated by a patriarch. It is a result of an encounter, and the mediator of this relation is a prophet. Hosea 12 is perhaps one of the first attempts to emphasize Moses' role in the Exodus tradition. Interestingly, the Pentateuchal narrative of the Exodus also highlights the idea that Yahweh was known by the Hebrews only in relation with the Exodus and also constructs Moses as a prophet. And this brings me now to my two texts, Exodus 3 and 4 and 6, and their functions in the non-priestly and priestly Exodus narrative. I do not go here into the chaotic situation in current discussion about the formation of the Pentateuch. It's more for some uh, scholars a question of faith than a question of arguments. So I won't here discuss the, I, I give my faith confession. Uh, so I think uh, we should give up definitely the traditional documentary hypothesis. We can still agree, I think, on a consensus about P and non-P, the question becomes more complicated whether to know if non-P is always pre-P or post-P, and this is also the case with Exodus 3 and 4. So uh, against my dear friend Konrad Schmid, I would say Exodus 3 and 4 is not only post-P, it's part post-P, but it's also pre-P, as I want to show now. But this is not the main topic of my talk. What interests me more is how this uh, story is about <coughs> the revelation of the divine name. Of course, it's a unified story. It starts with Moses' arrival and, and ends with his return. But if you look at the end and the return to Jethro, there is a strange uh, repetition. In verse 18, Moses got already the order, uh, knows that he got the order and tells Jethro that he has to leave uh, for Egypt. And then in 19, a little bit late, the Lord again says to Moses that he should go to, uh, <coughs> back to Egypt. So this verse does not make much sense after 418, since Moses had already informed Jethro about his return. However, it makes good sense after 223, the beginning, uh, Alpha. And if you read these both texts together, you have an older story, uh, as already observed by uh, Martin Not, an older Exodus story into which the story of Moses' call was integrated. I will come back to that. As uh, William Propp states in his commentary, Exodus 3, 4 is a key passage for the documentary analysis of the Torah. Maybe so. But the question is, can you really reconstruct two or three parallels account? And people who are always insisting on the divine name should also recognize that, in fact, we have three divine names in the story. We have Yahweh and Elohim, but we have also Ha. Elohim. And Ha Elohim, it's a strange expression. Uh, this uh, variant often contains the idea of a mysterious, of an unrevealed, of an obscure God. And in uh, Exodus 3, its concentrated use is probably related to the revelation of the divine name. The expression is used until verse 13, until the verse where Yahweh then is revealing himself. 
In an absolute form, this term is relative Ra compared to Elohim and no longer appears in the Exodus narrative until Exodus 18. And Exodus 18, at least the first part, the encounter between Jethro and Moses and his first sacrifice for Yahweh is in a way related to uh, Exodus uh, 3. So what interests me now is the fact that Moses here is appointed as a prophet. And this is something which may be related, of course, to Hosea 12, but it may also give us some clue about the dating of this text, because the closest parallel of this uh, appointment is in Jeremiah 1. Moses appears here as a prophet, like in Hosea 12, with, through whom Yahweh will lead his people out of Egypt in agreement with Hosea. And the same idea also occurs in Deuteronomy 18, 15 to 20, a passage which is also paralleled in Jeremiah 1, 4 to 10. In Deuteronomy 18, Moses again is presented as the first prophet. So if you like letters, you should not label this J or E, you should label it D, like Deuteronomist. After Moses' prophetic call, the narrative turns now to the question of the identity of the deity that is about to appoint him. This question is already brought up in verse 6 in the scene of the burning bush, where the divine self-presentation, I am the God of your father, is followed by the opposition, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. This is grammatically awkward and already amended in the Samaritan Pentateuch and in some Greek manuscript. The opposition appears as a later attempt to create a link with the patriarchal uh, traditions. And one may also here recall an observation made by Rolf Rentorf and others, according to which the land that God promises to the Israelites is introduced in Exodus 3 as if it were a completely unknown land, a land flowing where the milk and honey flows, and etc. Interestingly, it is not said to have been promised to the patriarch, as it is the case in the priestly story of Moses' call in Exodus 6. This may indicate that in the original story of Exodus 3, there were no mention of the patriarch at all. And this can also be shown uh, <coughs> in the revelation of the divine name. After Moses makes a second objection, he does not know the name of the ancestral God. And Yahweh re reveals himself, or does not reveal himself, first through the abundantly commented expression, Ehye Asha Ehye. The following verses identifies Yahweh again as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There are strong arguments that this verse did not belong to the original narrative. First of all, this speech is introduced after verse 14 by Vayome Ot Elohim, which clearly indicates an addition. And the sense of the addition is an attempt to create a parallel with the priestly idea expressed in Exodus 6 too, that even if Yahweh did not appear to the patriarchs under his real name, he is of course the god of the patriarchs. If one considers verse 15 as an addition, then the transition from 14 to 16 is even smoother. There's only one divine speech which starts with the word play on the tetragrammaton and then finally reveals the real name Yahweh in a second step. Of course, here also, and this is circular, I admit I have to uh, postulate that uh, the uh, <coughs> identification with the patriarch is written first on the margins of a scroll before later copies integrated into the text. I don't want here to discuss uh, the original uh, form of the text, which you can have here. I think you should also have a handout if it circulated. I don't know if it did. If not, it's not a problem. Uh, <clears throat> so what interests me here is the intention of the story. The intention of the story legitimates Moses' status as Israel's proto-prophet and recognizes that knowledge of the divine name is connected to the Exodus. The story, as observed by Michaeli, Berge, Konrad Schmid, and others, shares with Exodus 6 the idea that the revelation of the divine name Yahweh is something new. In the original text, the deity presents itself as Yahweh's patriarchal god, and Moses identifies his god with the ancestral deity of the, patriarch, of the uh, Hebrews. The fact that ancestral gods do not bear personal names is attested also by texts from Ugarit that often mentions Ilu Ibi, the god of the father. The author of Exodus 3 wants to emphasize that this unknown god is in fact the deity Yahweh. 
A similar procedure, as we will see, can be observed in Exodus 6. Before turning to this text, let me just remind that Exodus 3 was not initially part of the oldest story, as we have seen. In the oldest story, we had first the oppression in Egypt, the birth of uh, Moses, and then probably goes further with five, and so on. And some uh, verses of four. Uh, I s briefly, because I don't have time, I would say the parallels with Sargon's birth account uh, makes it quite probable that the original story, written story, dates from the seventh century and uh, is probably a counter history to Neo Assyrian royal ideology. This can also be uh, fostered and <coughs> confirmed by the use of uh, the Ari Miskinot in Exodus 1.11, which has nothing to do with Egypt, but a lot with Assyria. So the insertion of the figure of Moses into this narrative and its construction as a royal figure is probably linked to the Judean rewriting of an older northern Exodus tradition. Coming now to Exodus 6. And here again, if you look at the structure of the text, you see the importance of the divine name, which is really uh, <coughs> structuring the whole text. The structure reveals the importance of the divine presentation Anohi Yavi because it appears for four times. The self-presentation in 2 and 8 frame the divine speech, whereas the formula in 6 and 7 is in both cases followed by the almost identical statement, who will bring you out from the burdens of Egypt. Here, as in Exodus 3, Yahweh characterizes himself as the God that brings out of Egypt. In contrast to <coughs> the original version of Exodus 3, Exodus 6 insists on the strong continuity between the patriarchs and the Exodus. The Exodus and the conquest of the land are here presented in the divine speech as a result of the divine covenant and promises made to the patriarchs. In the primeval history, <coughs> sorry, uh, in uh, verses 3, you have uh, this clear reference to uh, Genesis 17, verse 1, which allows the priestly author to construct a history of the divine revelation into three stages. Uh, in the history of the origins, it is Elohim. Then, in the time of the patriarchs, it is uh, El Shaddai. And only for Moses and Israel and the Exodus generation, the real name of Yahweh is revealed. Which allows then, of course, Israel to be the only nation of being capable to worship Yahweh by means of an adequate sacrificial cult. P advocates, contrary to the Deuteronomist, a kind of an inclusive monotheism. All people of the earth venerate the same God, uh, whether they call him Elohim, El Shaddai, or Yahweh. Contrary to Exodus 3, the revelation here happens in Egypt and not on the mountain of God. The idea, the idea of a divine revelation is in Egypt is paralleled in this text from the book of Ezekiel, where Yahweh also made himself known in Egypt. So according to the priestly tradition, uh, and also to Ezekiel 20, God uh, disclosed his true name in Egypt. So the story of the Exodus is also, and above all, the story of the revelation of the divine name. So. If we compare briefly Exodus 3 and 6, we can say that, of course, the location are different, mountain of God in three variants, and Egypt. But don't forget that Exodus 3 is inserted in a story in which Moses is also in the south. He is uh, with his Midianite uh, father-in-law. Both texts agree said Yahweh was not always Israel's God, but he revealed himself to the people by the intermediary of Moses. In the context of the Pentateuchal narrative, this presentation emphasizes the central role of the Exodus tra tradition by transforming the patriarchal narratives into a prologue to, of a sorts and also legitimates the figure of Moses as the exclusive mediator and Israel's first prophet. Both texts are not older than the 6th century, but they may conserve the historical memory that Yahweh has not always been the God of Israel. For sure, neither Exodus, nor Exodus, neither Exodus 3 nor Exodus 6 are historical texts. But they may preserve a long durée, a long-term memory of the adoption of the deity Yahweh in relation to Egyptian and other southern tradition. 
So I come to some very short historical speculation, who will probably not please to everybody, but uh, anyhow. And here again, I bring uh, back uh, the Manapta Stela, which we discussed already on several occasions. I don't want to discuss very much. There is also now uh, another Stela, apparently, which uh, some people claim to contain also the name of Israel. But as Thomas Schneider told me yesterday, that is nonsense. So I just showed you a nice photo, and uh, <coughs> I go back to the Manapta Stela. Uh, what is clear in the Menepta Stela, even as we said yesterday and also Nadav Naaman said, that the location of the entity Israel is not, uh, cannot be established with certainty and all attempts to locate it in the Central Highlands rest on preconceived idea of its place, I agree with that, it is clear that the Stela refers to a group located in the Levant whose patron deity is apparently El or Ilu, like in Ugarit. It is Israel, it's not Israyahu. That means that uh, Israel is, or the name Israel is older than the veneration of Yahweh by a group called Israel. And that fits quite well with some biblical text, five indeed, uh, that locate Yahweh in the south and that describe an encounter between him and Israel. Judges 5, with uh, a parallel, uh, Eloistic parallel in Psalm 68, where Yahweh is coming from Seir, from Edom, and where he is paralleled or identified with the Sinai. Then Deuteronomy 33, <coughs> 33 again Sinai, Seir, and Mount Param, and Habakkuk 3, Teman, and Mount Param. In the Hebrew Bible, Teman is often uh, related to Edomite territory, Edomite connection, as you can see on these texts, or we can also see, say it's a more general term for the South that, uh, <coughs> of course, includes then the Edomite territory. In regard to Teman, and this also had been brought up already yesterday by Israel Finkelstein, we should have a look uh, <coughs> on Kuntilet Adrut, even if Many things are still disputed. Was this a school, a resting place, a trade place, a sanctuary? I think Israel Finkelstein now has definitely shown that it should be dated in the first half of the 8th century. And what is of interest uh, after the Editio Princeps, we have several mentions of a Yahweh from Teman or Ha-Teman. Sometimes it's Teman, sometimes it's Ha-Teman, uh, associated with Asherah. And this is an indication that still in the 8th century, Yahweh was venerated as a deity from the south. On the other hand, another inscription invokes a Yahweh from Shomron, from, Samari, from Samaria, again with Asherah. So if this text, <coughs> sorry, if this site was used by travelers or worshippers from Israel, Samaria, it is interesting that they still acknowledge the existence of a southern Yahweh. And the existence of a Yahweh from Teman in the 8th century may then tentatively be related to the famous Shashu nomads in some Egyptian inscription, especially from the time of Amenophis III and Ramses II, where we have the famous, uh, the famous, famous uh, Shashu Yahweh, Yahoo. Uh, this uh, expression Yahoo seems here to be a toponym which may also designate a deity, and you may here, of course, compare what's going on in Judges 5, or it's also say Yahweh Ze Sinai. In the list from Amara, the different Shashu groups are listed under the Shashu of the land, or the Shashu land Seir, which according to Manfred Weipert could be a kind of a title indicating the location of the different Shashu tribes. An Edomite location, uh, for this Shasu group was made plausible also by the excavations of Thomas Levy and his team, who states that in the case of Wadi Fidan, the archaeological records supports, in a way, the biblical and historical evidence. So it may therefore be plausible that the veneration of Yahweh as a god who defeats the Egyptian was brought to Israel by a Shasu group. 
this does not necessarily mean that all Israel was Shasu, I don't know. Uh, but as we have seen already also this morning, there are so many uh, possibilities to understand the description of Egypt as a house of a bondage. So it is therefore a plausible speculation that Yahweh was brought to Israel by a group that worshipped an Edomite or a southern Yahweh. Was Yahweh Edomite God? That's another question. Maybe there was also a narrative about a figure like Moses. Uh, <coughs> since his Midianite connections can hardly be explained as an invention. As well as the kernel of Exodus 18, where his father-in-law, Chetro, offers the first sacrifice to Yahweh. This is the old Kenite Midianite hypothesis. I will finish in one minute. Uh, <coughs> which is uh, maybe to reinvestigate. Though the biblical text of the divine revelation of Yahweh's name retain, therefore, I would say, traces of memory, to quote an expression of Jan Asman, of a non autochthonous origin of Yahweh. Of course, there are also other traces of memories in uh, Manetho, in Artapanus, Flavius Josephus, but these have been uh, alluded to yesterday, and I come to a very, very brief conclusion if you give me 30 seconds. The biblical, exodus, the biblical Exodus narrative was written down for the first time in Judah. Moses appears here as a prototype for Josiah, and the situation of Egyptian oppression seems to reflect the Assyrian situation. The Exodus tradition is, of course, older and came to Judah from Israel after 722. The literary contours of this tradition cannot be reconstructed. Hosea 12 shows, however, how Yahweh, the God of the Exodus, is opposed to the Jacob tradition. This may reflect an attempt to make the Exodus the official foundation myth of Israel. The two accounts of Yahweh's revelation to Moses in Exodus 3 and 6, also written in the 6th century, still keep the memory that Yahweh was not an autochthonous deity, but was imported from the south. And this theory gains support from the inscription of Kuntilet Ashut, but also from the evidence about the Shasu groups, since some of them apparently worshipped a deity called Yahoo. Even, this brings, even if this brings us to the last century of the second millennium BCE, the biblical texts have preserved a long-term memory about the exotic origins, not of Israel, but of Yahweh. Thank you. Appearing late in the program apparently does not preclude introducing new ideas. And so, thank you. Uh, we have time for a few questions. Um, yeah. Ron Hindle, please. I, I want to thank you for your wonderful talk. I want to pick up on the okay, Ron Hendel, I want to thank you for your wonderful talk. And I just want to ask you, uh, this is a refrain that people have asked various people. Yeah. If the biblical texts have preserved a long durée yeah. memory about the Exodus origins of Yahweh, are you positing a complicated oral tradition that that spans that long durée, or do you do you posit a scribal tradition? Yeah. Yeah, thank you for this complicated question. Out, yeah, just draw uh, you out on that. No, I, I think, and maybe I, I said it too too quickly. I, I don't think that we can reconstruct an original Exodus uh, narrative, if, if be it oral or be it literary. What we can see that there are several biblical texts that are confirmed by texts outside the Bible, as Kuntilet Ashut, and maybe also by the uh, Shasu files, that there is still a knowledge even at the very latest stage of the editing of the Pentateuch and the Prophets, about the idea that Yahweh has not always been the God of Israel, uh, yeah, the God of Israel, that he comes from the south. So that I can say. Now I can speculate how was he brought there. And of course you can say that uh, the story of how even if you look at the Sinai, you see in the Sinai narrative how Israel in a way becomes the people of Yahweh. I never would say that the Sinai pericope dates from the 10th century, but still, there is a memory that there needed to be a sort of a pact or covenant to make Israel the, uh, the, uh, the patron deity of, uh, of Israel. I would be more cautious about the reconstruction of uh, old Exodus narrative. I think you have this tradition, which is probably northern, as been shown by uh, 1 Kings 12. But what is behind? And I would even say, but this is also, of course, speculation, that there is an old tradition in which Moses is not 
related, to which Moses is not related. I think Moses' tradition and Exodus' tradition probably uh, first circulated a little bit separately and were brought together quite lately, maybe in the south, maybe in Judah. I think we need to break here. Uh, again, we can continue this discussion outside. Uh, we ask you to be back here promptly at 10.30 because we in want to uh, start and keep time. Yeah, and uh, let's give a hand to all the speakers. That was a great session. And um, I would just like to say that I ask all the conference uh, speakers and their significant others participants uh, to join us at the bear outside where we're going to do a group photo. Okay, right now we leave here, we go to the bear, and we do a group photo.